Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aoife. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Trinity College, Dublin. And this evening, I'd like to shed some light on my research into solar cell technologies. Every time you boil a kettle, download a Game of Thrones episode, or charge your newly bendable iPhone 6, an average of 82% of the electricity you use comes from the combustion of fuels such as coal, gas, and oil. These fuels are not only harmful to the environment, but they make us dependent on geopolitically unstable regions of the world, and however much we procrastinate about it, they're going to be gone in 100 years' time. Meanwhile, less than 1% of our energy is accounted for by truly renewable, sustainable sources, such as those generated by wind, tidal, or solar energy. If we could harness all of the energy from the sun that hits the earth over a period of just two hours, we could fuel the earth for a year. If we could cover an area the size of France in solar cells that could convert just 10% of the sun's energy into electricity, we could meet all of the Earth's energy demands. So how do these solar technologies work? Well, if you imagine that you are an electron, if many of you know, uh, electricity is the flow of tiny particles called electrons. Now, if you're at a party with all the other cool electrons, there's a problem. Someone has invited too many electrons and there is no room to move. And double, oh no, this house is on a Nama ghost estate, so the builders never got around to putting in stairs. But never fear, solar energy is here. If we shine the sun's light onto our solar material, we can impart energy from the sun to our electrons, giving them the boost they need to jump up to the first floor. These electrons are now free to move around, and they leave behind holes that other electrons can move into. However, there is a trick. We need to get the gap between the ground floor and the first floor just right. Too big, the sun's energy isn't enough to boost our electrons up. Too small, and our power output is greatly decreased. So we need to find a material that has this so-called Goldilocks gap that is just the right size for the sun's energy. Now, it's not the only criterion for an ideal solar cell material. We also want something that is cheap something that's readily available around the world, something that's easy to work with and manufacture. We also want something that's har not harmful to either humans or the environment, and we want to conduct electricity well. So there are hundreds of thousands of potential materials. You can go into a lab, make them all, hope to get lucky and that one of the more toxic ones doesn't kill you, or you can do what I do. I use quantum chemistry calculations on supercomputers to mathematically model these materials and predict their properties. I can calculate their conductivity, their structure, their energy gap, and therefore assess which candidates are most likely to provide a solution to the solar energy materials. So I can therefore save the experimental chemists time, money, and potentially years of their lifespan. Computational chemistry, saving the world and your friendly neighborhood lab-dwelling chemist. Thank you.